Good morning. Welcome back to Christian Companions. Uh, we are on September 20th in the middle of Genesis 42. If you stumbled upon this video on YouTube or on our website and you are a little confused about what's happening, this is our 55 and older 1030 Sunday school uh, that is meeting strictly through videos and um, different things through COVID. So if you're watching this and you think, oh, this will, cool. I, this will be cool, I can do a Sunday school, we have a book. So if you're interested in participating, you can ask me, I'll have more books. But if you're not, then you might get a little confused along the way. Just throwing that out there. Again, as for all you who are normally in this room, good morning, hello, welcome back, glad you're here. All that jazz, wish you were here to ask questions and so on and so forth. As I said, today is September 20th. We are in Genesis 42, 6 through 25a. And just like I said last week, and I probably will say up until mid-October, a lot of this first few lessons are very narrative heavy, and narrative tends not to be something that we need to dive into, like headlong into what the Hebrew word for brothers is and why that's important. There's not a ton of, there's not a ton of things that we need to look at and, and worry about. So... This might be shorter compared to other weeks, maybe not compared to last week, which I think was only about 30 minutes. You would have, you would have been at lunch. You would have still had to order breakfast, I think, at this point. It doesn't matter. So we're going to start today, though. Genesis 42, 6 through 25a. Let's read it together. It's in the NIV. It says this. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? He asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Then he remembered his dream about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unprotected. But they replied, your servants were 12 brothers. Your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. And he put them all in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. But you must bring your youngest brother to me so that the words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. They said to one another, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but he would not listen. That's why his distress has come on us. Well, this, that's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you to sin, to not sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now he must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep. But then he came, then, oh my goodness, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon take from, he had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain to put each man's silver back in his sack and to give them provision for their journeys. Whew, might be in for a tough one if I'm just reading. So, uh, let's do this. The, the introduction is just about surprise encounters. Um, I don't think we really need to worry about that today. I know this is going to be kind of short just because it's a narrative, but this is a surprise encounter. Have you ever experienced a surprise encounter? Uh, one time when I was a little boy, I got to hug Bill Self because um, he used to coach at the University of Illinois. He did a he did a talk at a church. We went and saw him, uh, and I for some reason I hugged him. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I mean, I wasn't like four. I would have been seven. Like too old to hug strangers. This is, this turn this this took a turn. This video. Uh, but I remember, I remember vividly, maybe I was trying to get a picture that makes sense. It was a side hug. I bet that was it. It was a side hug. And I put my arm around him well, around his, probably his waist. Cause I was a little boy, but still, uh, that was a surprise encounter. 
for me. I wasn't expecting to get a picture with him. So uh, this is a surprise encounter for Joseph and his brothers, and soon his father, everybody involved. Surprise encounter. That's all I really need to know about the, the introduction. Excuse me. It's a hot one today. Whew. Especially in here. Be glad you're not in here today. It's sweating. Whew. All right, but the context is important. When the Egyptians began to feel the effects of the predicted famine, that was last week, uh, they cried out to Pharaoh for relief. Pharaoh sent them to Joseph, whom he had appointed to prepare Egypt for the years of famine. The famine, however, affected lands other than Egypt as well. As a result, all the world came to Egypt to buy food. Joseph's homeland was among those, and jo Jacob urged his sons to travel to Egypt and purchase food. Exactly how much of the seven-year famine had occurred before the brothers went to Egypt is not clear. Later, when Joseph revealed his identity, he told them that only two of seven total years had passed. For the first journey to Egypt, Jacob did not permit Benjamin, one of two sons of Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, the other son being Joseph, to go. Jacob had already lost his favorite son, Joseph. Jacob did not want to risk losing his second favorite, Benjamin. Thus, ten brothers traveled to Egypt without him. So, yeah, pretty standard. I mean, if you remember last week, uh, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams, and the dreams are there's going to be seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And so then Joseph gave him a plan and said, here's how you should prepare for that. And Joseph was made second in command of Egypt, and now his brothers have come to eat. I think this is another example of why I personally think, um, and we've had this conversation here before, the whole idea that the flood narrative, uh, and this is a totally random thought, you don't need this or anything, this is free. Um, the flood narrative, it says the whole world, and in here, again, they reference that all the world came to Egypt to buy food. I don't think that means that like Algonquins <laughs> or Cherokee from North America came to Israel for food. I think what this means is the whole world they knew about. So this is, uh, for instance, the ends of the earth was kind of understood to be Ethiopia and India. That's kind of what the idea was that there was nothing past that. So yeah, just again, that was free. Take that with you. If you're watching this and you're like, I don't get what he's saying, email me or call me or something. We'll talk about it. We don't need to get into it right now. Uh, so yeah, let's just keep going. Go to uh, 6A. Yeah, it's going to probably be quick because we're going to do 6A and 6B. We're just going to do all of 6 at once. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold, who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. So Joseph had been appointed as governor and second in command to Pharaoh after his proposal for how to prepare Egypt for the coming years of famine. His tasks of preparation for the famine were complete. Now the tasks of distributing aid, distributing aid were his primary responsibility. At this point, the people still had enough money to purchase the grain than they, that they needed. And then 6B, showing respect for a foreign dignitary, the brothers bowed down appropriately to Joseph. His, this almost fulfills Joseph's dream of some two decades earlier recorded in Genesis 37.9. We say almost because only 10 of the 11 stars, brothers, we're doing the bowing at this point. So yeah, the fulfillment, God came through with that promised dream and here's the fulfillment. The brothers are bowing down indeed to Joseph and his authority. As we go through this, really try to imagine this scene because this would be 10 brothers, all pretty, a pretty wide range of ages. I mean, the oldest was probably, I would say at minimum, 15 to 20 years older than Joseph. And so these are older men with families and probably grandchildren. Some, maybe some have grandchildren at this point, uh, depending on when your kids get married off in this time. But this is a wide range of people coming from a long way away. And they see Joseph, but they think it's an Egyptian. We'll get into it. But just really in your mind's eye, as best you can, imagine this scenario. Because it is awfully fascinating to think about. So, 7 and 8. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Joseph recognized, this is the commentary, Joseph recognized his brothers immediately, even though about 20 years had passed since he last saw them. One can only imagine the look on Joseph's face at this surprise encounter. Perhaps he had thought, he would never see them again. But what, But there they were, 
How should he treat them? What should he say? The recognition is not two-way, however, as indicated by the phrase, they did not recognize him. Contributing factors are Joseph's Egyptian clothing and a closely trimmed beard in keeping with Egyptian custom. Above all, none of the brothers expected to encounter Joseph anywhere, let alone in the position of governor of Egypt. Joseph had probably pondered on many a day how he would respond to his brothers if he ever saw them again. As he spoke harshly or with a tone of severity, Joseph may have been buying time to ponder his forthcoming big reveal in more depth. Yeah, who knows why he responds this way. We can talk, we'll talk about it soon, but um, of course he's not recognizable. I mean, if you sell your brother into slavery, <laughs> hypothetically, of course, you are expecting, I mean, slaves don't just work their way up the corporate ladder till they're in charge of a country. So if even if they did see a man that they would recognize 20 years later as their brother, they're expecting a worn out, sun beaten, rough handed slave of a man. This is probably, I mean, if he's second in command, he's not working any fields. Uh, he's in traditional Egyptian garb. Uh, maybe he has that fancy eye makeup that you see Egyptians have. Maybe he walks like an Egyptian, that whole thing. Just kidding. Uh, but yeah, you would not recognize this person that's sitting, stand, that's sitting in front of you, especially when you're bowing before him. Like you wouldn't expect this at all. It's, again, the, to picture this in your mind's eye, it, it's quite a scene. 9A, then he remembered his dreams about them. Uh, seeing his brothers bow to him brought back to Joseph memories, Joseph's memory, his dreams of authority and his family. He surely must also have remembered how much his brothers despised him on account of those dreams. Ironically, their actions to prevent any ascent to power on Joseph's part had done the opposite in contributing directly to his current status. Human nature suggests that there may have been more sense of satisfaction on Joseph's part when he remembered his dreams while his brothers bowed before him. I don't know about that. I struggle with that. Human nature suggests that Joseph had satisfaction that his brothers were indeed bowing and his dream had come true. I don't know if, I don't know if you would feel satisfaction. Like, you would, you would be relieved that your dreams came true? Maybe, but also these are the men that beat you and sold you into slavery. This is your, the, this, this is your father and your mother's children. Like, I don't know if it'd be relief. I think it'd be, oh yeah, this is coming to, you, oh man, I would, you'd be spinning. I don't think there'd any, be any men, minute of just like a, hmm, right, dream came true. No, you're, there's a lot more going on than going, oh yeah, dreams, right? It's crazy. I disagree with that. So, 9B, and he said to them, you are spies. You have come to see where our land is unprotected. Crazy. Why the memory of his dream dreams caused Joseph to accuse his brothers of something he knew was false is unclear, but there are some theories. One suggestion is that even though he we wouldn't call his re this revenge, Joseph can't resist making his brother squirm for a while. Another theory is that Joseph uses the line of interrogation we see here to test his brother's character. Have they improved any in the two decades since selling him into slavery? The accusation, you are spies, has a ring of uh, believability. Coming to spy under the guise of buying food is quite plausible. Buying food would take resources from the nation while also providing a cover story as the brothers scout out where Egypt is unprotected. Place is vulnerable to attack by an enemy, though a payback, or by an enemy, though a payback or revenge motive seems reasonable from a purely human standpoint. Joseph's true motivation seems to have been more noble than that. The longer he could hide his identity behind a mask of harshness, the more likely it was to elicit truthful statements from his brothers. Joseph surely noticed that Benjamin, his younger brother and the other son of their mother, Rachel, was absent from the group of brothers. He must have wondered if Benjamin was dead. And what about their father, Jacob? It is also possible that Joseph desired to find out w more about his brothers. Did they still despise him after all these years? Had they repented of their treatment of him? Yeah, I think that one's more likely. It's more likely that um, he, <laughs> I mean, there's, again, just the slew of emotions that you're going through. And to assume, uh, to assume that he's doing this for revenge, I think is a, as a jump you're really trying to make for a man that is of Joseph's status of what he's done in his life. You know, he didn't see, 
he does it with the Bible doesn't tell us that he sought revenge on Potiphar for false imprisonment. It doesn't say that he sought revenge on the cupbearer for forgetting him. It just seems like Joseph's a pretty gracious guy. So I, I would say it's probably that latter idea of I want to extend my time with my family. And before I reveal myself, I want to learn as much as I can about what's going on and get truthful statements and not what happens when all comes to fruition. Verse 10. Yikes. This is going to be quick cuts. Verse 10. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. Modern interrogation practices is to interview suspects separately to see if their stories match. But Joseph knows most of the important parts of the story already. His accusations seem to have been intended to put his brothers on the defensive. If so, the desired effect is achieved. Verse 11. We are all the sons of one man. Your servants are honest men, not spies. Joseph may, Joseph may well have found dark humor in the claim of his brothers to be honest men, even though he doesn't yet know that they lied to his father regarding Joseph's fate. <clears throat> and then verse 12. No, he said to them, you have come to see where our land is unpre- unprotected. Joseph continued in accusation mode. People under stress may make unguarded comments. We may speculate that Joseph hoped that his brothers would do just that, revealing in the process important family information. Verse 13, but they replied, your servants were 12 brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father and one is no more. And their hasty denials, the brothers reveal several pieces of information that Joseph could immediately verify as true. Therefore, he had no reason to doubt the parts he could not verify. Both his father, Jacob, and his youngest brother, Benjamin, were still alive. And then finally, verse 14, Joseph said to them, it is just as I told you, you are spies. Still, Joseph challenged the men's truthfulness with a terrifying accusation of spying. How could they prove their innocence if this powerful man was convinced of their guilt? So I know that was rapid fire, but they were really short. Yeah, this is just a rat-a-tat-tat back and forth between the brothers. Um, You're clearly spies. No, we're not. We're just here to buy food. Yes, you're clearly spies. No, uh, we're not. Yes, you're clearly spies. No, you're, we're 12 brothers. One is back home, one is dead, and the father is there too. Um, so yeah, again, the motive of why he's doing this is st- to me is always a little hazy. And I'm going to just press into that idea that it is because he wanted to get honesty from them and get them to stay there and... It could be a lot of things, guys. Like, I mean, there, who knows this motivation other than Joseph and Jesus? So, um, but I, again, to think it's petty revenge, I think is a step too far. So, one thing that I think is important to note it is clear that Joseph knows that he has a younger brother in Benjamin. Um, you don't really get that in the, in the story of when he's beaten and sold, that there's another brother. But that, but Benjamin would have been so young that he wouldn't have gone out with the other brothers to herd the sheep. So at this time, so he probably does know that he has a younger brother. I think a lot of times when we read this, we kind of assume that he didn't know about him. Just food for thought. <laughs> Let's keep going. So verse 15 and 16. And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Send one of your number to get your brother. The rest of you will be kept in prison so that your words may be tested to see if you are telling the truth. If you are not, then as surely as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. So Joseph gave the men what seems to be, seemed to be to them to be a chance to prove that they were who they say they or who they claim to be. But Joseph already knew they were telling the truth. His agenda was therefore different from what it seemed to be to the brothers, an agenda that becomes clearer as the story unfolds. Perhaps to emphasize how serious he was, Joseph swore twice, saying, as surely as Pharaoh lives. The ruse of pretending to be thoroughly Egyptian continued. Yeah, and it's revealed later that he's speaking Egyptian to them through an interpreter, which is, again, another reason why you wouldn't really believe this is your brother. Verse 17, and he put them all in custody for three days. Why this three-day timeout? It may have been a tactic to emphasize Joseph's power to impose his will. Alternatively, it could have been that Joseph needed more time to consider how best to convince his brothers it was necessary to bring Benjamin to him. Again, I think parsing Joseph's reasoning here is going to be kind of hard. Um, who knows? Maybe there's maybe there's an Egyptian law somewhere that says 
claimed spies have to be held for three days. Who knows? Um, there could be a lot of reasons and a lot of motives, and I don't think we'll know this side of eternity. Um, but again, I'm gonna, uh, I'm probably gonna always assume the best of Joseph, considering there's, I don't think there's a spot in Joseph's story where he sins and God has to correct him. He's almost always with God, as you'll see in this next verse. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and you will live, for I fear God. On the third day, apparently after more thought, Joseph was ready to dictate different sets of conditions. Before revealing his new plan, however, Joseph gave the rationale for his decision, his fear of God. From our viewpoint, Joseph clearly referred to his fear of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Such a statement might have tipped his brothers off that something was different about this Egyptian governor. However, his brothers could be excused for not understanding what Joseph was asserting. For one thing, the name used to refer to God is a plural word that often refers to the true God over a thousand times in the Old Testament, but can also refer generically to supernatural beings who may be mistaken for gods. Though God could be differentiated from false gods easily by identifying him as the creator and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he has not yet revealed his name. So context could cause the brothers to think that Joseph feared some God, but which one remained a mystery. To further muddle the situation, Joseph looked Egyptian, had an Egyptian name, and was married to the daughter of the priest of Ra. Joseph's brothers probably assumed Zaphonath Penea worshipped Ra and other Egyptian gods. Uh, Zaphonath Penea, of course, being Joseph's Egyptian name. And I think it also goes, it's worth saying, he's speaking through an interpreter. So maybe he used the Egyptian word for God, the God that he understood it to be of his father, and the interpretation got lost. Who knows? A lot of reasons. Uh, but, I mean, I think this is, in any context, I think this would be a good thing. I mean, if you were held at gunpoint and you said, like, and somebody said, well, and the, the guy holding the gun said, well, don't worry, I'm not going to do anything to you because I have a healthy fear and faith of God. Even if he was talking about another God, I think that would be reassuring because that's a show of morality. Um, even with a gun in your face, who knows? But in any context, if somebody says I have a fear for God or a fear of God, I think that could be a good thing and is worth having a conversation about fearing God. Verse 19, this is going to be a quick rat tat tat 19, 20, or just 19 and 20, excuse me. If you're an honest men, well, let one of your brother, brothers stay here in prison while the rest of you go and take grain back for your starving households. So only one brother rather than nine would be required to stay in Egypt as ransom. The others would take grain back to Canaan. Verse 20, but you must bring your youngest brother to me so that your words may be verified and that you may not die. This they proceeded to do. So Joseph did not tell them when to come back, only that they must bring the youngest brother with them. Judging from Joseph's words, the punishment went from espionage for espionage was death. The following verse continues as though this sentence never happened. This presents a significant jump in the narrative. Excuse me. I'll tell you, it's warm in here. I'm running out of breath. Yeah, so <clears throat> he kind of changes it up, saying instead of just one of you having to go back and getting your brother, now you can all go back, but one of you has to stay. And again, uh, he kind of the narrative kind of gets a little fate, a little hazy here in verse twenty-one. So they said to one another. Surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. Though the biblical account does not mention Joseph's distress at the time, we are unsurprised to learn that Joseph's suffering was evident to his brothers. So intense was their hatred and contempt that Joseph's cries for mercy went willfully unheard. Yet those cries echoed back to them in this moment, confirming their guilt and her heralding that punishment was finally at hand for their crime or so they believed. It is striking that these 10 men were blaming themselves for the death of the man who was standing before them. 21b, that's why this distress has come on us. The brothers believe that when one encountered distress or troubles, it was a punishment for some previous wrongdoing. That thinking is reflected throughout the Bible. We may still feel that our struggles are God's judgment on us for our past sins, but like the brothers, we see only part of each story and should be wary of interpreting too confidently God's intentions in any situation. Ironically, this trouble has visited them because of Joseph, not as punishment, but because God has worked through their sin to save them. Though the brothers believe God is punishing them, in fact, he is about to deliver their whole family from famine. So this is the part where I get to teach and talk. There is a great idea 
in a Eastern religion called karma. So karma in Buddhism, maybe even in Hinduism, Hinduism I think is more dharma. I'd have to look that up. Eastern religion is a little hazy to me. So karma, everybody knows what karma is now. What goes around comes around. Kind of everything has an equal and opposite reaction. If I poke out somebody's eye, my eye will some at some point get poked out. Or in a more ethereal sense, everything good I do and everything bad I do is set in a weight and then I come back in the next life and that the weight from my previous life weighs to my next life and where I come back in the next life. So if I'm terrible in this life, I'll come back as a, as a homeless person. If I do great in this life, then I'll come back as a rich man, so on and so on. So here's why I'm going into this. The brothers here and a lot of even Christianity today, I think, has an idea of a karma system. And I call it... Um, karmatic Christianity. And it's, I won't say it's heresy and it's not blasphemy. It's just, I think, poor theology. Basically, it's the idea that if I do something, if I sin, then God will adjust for that in the universe, right? So if I sin against my wife, that night, something bad will happen to me. If I have a bad day today, or if I sin today, then tomorrow's going to be a bad day. Um, if I am good, then tomorrow will be good, and so on and so on and so on. So I have to do good deeds to be given good things and so on and so on. And it's hard because there's certain things that play into this, like the verse in Malachi, uh, which says, you know, God says, test me on this. Uh, if, you, if you give, then I'll open up the storehouses and reward you, basically saying whoever gives will receive. Um, and it's this idea of like kind of rewards from heaven. And that's very karmac karmatic. It's the idea of if we do well, then we'll receive well. And, and that's even true. I mean, that's the, that is true f kind of ultimately for us, right? We have this idea that, um, and, and it's true, but a life of sin will lead to judgment and hell. And a life of good and following Jesus will lead to heaven. And, and it's kind of you're putting the balances and you're putting the scales of justice and you're weighed. Uh, but I think our God doesn't rely on a simplistic scale system like karma, right? We're not, we don't subscribe to a karmatic Christianity or we shouldn't be, uh, your one day's worth of sin will not equal a bad day. Or it's even the idea, <laughs> this is a good one. If I sin, then my, then God will make my wife sick. Or if my wife sins, then I'll have to, then God will make me go to the hospital to prove a point to her, right? And, and so it's this kind of back and forth between our sinfulness and what God has to do for us. And that's just not how it works. God doesn't punish us for our sins on earth by making other people sick or hurting other people. Uh, he might allow us to get caught up in our sin, which isn't him punishing us, but uh, opening, like opening a door to, Actually, I wouldn't even say that he does that to us or allows for that to happen. I think when we sin, we kind of get wrapped up in our own sin and sin begets sin until we become a sinful person. And so really, I think the only time we can really I have an idea of what real karma in Christianity is, is at the end of our life where God judges our heart. But I honestly, this would be a good question. In the grand scale of justice, if we have more sin then we do good. How does God weigh that based on the grace of the, the grace of the cross? Because I would argue that almost, I would argue that all people have more sin than good in their life because we're just sinful people, all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And so how far does that grace extend and how far does the mercy extend before you hit God's justice? Uh, it's a good question. It's a, it's an important question. I don't know the answer to that. All I can do is continue to live like Jesus and rely on the grace of the cross. And so when I get to heaven and Jesus says, did you live a good life? And I can go, 
well, actually, I don't even know if they'll ask that. But if you were to ask, did you live a good life? I would say no, but luckily you did. <laughs> I, I tried my best and relied on you mostly. And you've done a lot more for me than I've done for other people. And I appreciate that. And that, that might be enough. Who knows? So, uh, but yeah, if you find yourself going, well, I sinned and then my wife got sick or I sinned and then my husband hurt himself uh, and those things are evened out. It's not true because that's karma and that's not how karma works. That's not how God works. And that's kind of what these guys are doing because we did this to our brother. We are now getting the punishment. It's like, no, that's not how God works. Like the, This is not how Yahweh, God and Jesus work. They don't punish you for your sins. I think like an equal balanced scale, I think that weighs out in the end more for your life. But again, it's the idea of grace versus justice. Whew. We, we could get into it pretty heavy. I think I'd rather have you ponder those questions and maybe talk to me later. So, but yeah, don't, don't get caught up in karmatic Christianity. I think that's the more important part. Don't find yourself trying to balance the bad with the good. Just always try to live like Jesus. That's what you got to worry about more than anything. Verse 22, Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Reuben is Jacob's firstborn. Before this moment, Joseph knew nothing of what Reuben had said in his defense. Reuben's statement about an accounting for Joseph's blood confirmed that he believed Joseph had died and that he considered all of the brothers present to be guilty of that death. Yeah, again, karmat, karmatic Christianity, karmatic Judaism. 23, they did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. Because of Joseph's cunning use of an interpreter, the brothers had, have been speaking frankly before him without realizing he could understand their private conversation. For long years, he must have wondered whether they felt any guilt or remorse for their actions against him. Though he had clearly found great purpose in his Egyptian life, part of Joseph wanted to know if his brothers had ever overcome their hatred of him. Yeah, of course you would. I wonder if the people that I loved and trusted the most, who then beat me up and sold me into slavery, are repentant of that fact. It's a fair thing to question. Uh, and it is very cunning, very, very sly to be using, to be speaking Egyptian and using interpreter and pretending you don't really know what's going on. 24a, he turned away from them and began to weep. So Joseph was not prepared for what he heard. The brother's words of remorse coupled with Reuben's personal expression of regret proved more than Joseph could handle. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Sorry, I thought there was more on the other page. Yeah, he turns away and weeps. Uh, he will weep again. Joseph's a crier, uh, men out there who are watching this. Joseph's one of the most manly men in the Bible, smart, strong, handsome, manly man, cries a lot and hard. Uh, I don't know if we encounter it next week, but at one point he cries. So I believe, I believe it's Joseph who cries so much that people outside are embarrassed for him. Like that's part of this. No, that's David. Dang. David also though, manly man, uh, killed 10,000, uh, you know, led a nation, led armies, had best friends that were warriors, cried so hard that people were embarrassed that he was crying, uh, was quite a dancer and musician, also a thing. Uh, so, but yes, he will cry more. We'll get to that later. Maybe, I don't know. Keep going. 24, but then came back and spoke to them again. Oh, he turned away from them and began to weep. 24B, but then came back and spoke to them again. He had Simeon taken from them and bound before their eyes. After composing himself, Joseph probably voiced again the terms necessary for safe return to Egypt. Joseph imprisoned Simeon as a surety until the brothers returned with the youngest one. Joseph probably hadn't meant to detain the oldest uh, probably had meant to detain the oldest one, Reuben, due to his status as firstborn son, but changed his mind after hearing Reuben's confession. Simeon is the second oldest of Jacob's sons. Yeah, I, that's a probably pretty fair assumption. He was like, I'll take Reuben. He's the oldest. And then, and he would have more skin in the game. He probably has more kids and more grandkids, therefore, uh, more likely to get Israel slash Jacob's uh, possession after he dies. But then Reuben was like, I told you not to do it. And so why not take Simeon? And then the conclusion, 25A. Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain, to put each man's silver back to his, in his sack, and to give them provisions for their journey. 
Before sending his brothers back to Canaan, Joseph took certain calculated steps because it was within his authority to set prices for grain. Joseph decided to send the food back with his brothers at no charge, but he refunded their silver without telling them. This strategy served Joseph in at least two ways. First, he blessed his brothers by not accepting their payment, thus allowing the money to be used for other purposes as necessary. Second, by not telling them what he would do, Joseph's actions made them fear God. Would the governor see them as thieves as well as spies? Was this finally God's plan to punish them for Joseph's death? No. How much worse could things get? Yeah. That's it. And that's, I mean, yeah. They, I don't know if we'll talk about that next week. I forgot to look ahead. No. Yeah, they basically, when they find out that their silver is back, they get a little worried because they're like, oh, great. The, this guy, this uh, super hardcore Egyptian is going to think that we stole all their silver back. This isn't good. Um, but yeah, so Joseph had a, I think Joseph had a plan. That's another thing. Maybe, maybe that's worth noting. Maybe Joseph spending 20 years in Egypt, he had developed a plan as to if I see my brothers again, here's how I'll do it. And he developed that plan and it worked perfectly. Who knows? We'll never know the motives this side of eternity, as I said, but that is it for this week. Next week is September 27th, Genesis 45. And uh, we'll talk about him revealing himself to his brother, saying, I am Joseph, and weeping all the more. Yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, as always, comments, concerns, or bold, salacious attempts to tell me I'm wrong, you can email me at samuelo at southrockchristian.com or call the church, 788-5503, anytime. I'm usually here Monday through Thursday. Uh, yeah, as always, also, I miss you guys. I wish you were in this room instead of a camera with a red light on it. So hopefully we can get back soon. In the meantime, if you need anything, let me know. If you have any questions, let me know, and I will see you next week. Bye.